So we're starting a new sermon series this week, Be the Victor. We're going to look at men and women in the Old and New Testament and learn from them their character, their story, the miraculous things that happened. And I'm trusting that God's going to help us to become more and more like him as we see these people who showed who he was and how he loves. Today, we're talking about Joshua. We're going to learn from this guy who was an Egyptian slave. That's how he started out. Then he became a personal assistant to Moses, a military commander who was really a genius, Joshua. And then eventually the leader of all Israel. He was mentored by Moses, and he becomes ultimately one of the greatest leaders of all time. So we're going to look at him, and we're going to learn from his courage, from his obedience, and from his faithfulness. When I think of mentors, I think of my dad, Ray, who passed away just a week or so ago. His memorial, by the way, is the 19th of this month at 11 a.m. Just throw that out there for you, get a little early information. But my dad was much like Joshua, faithful, obedient, <clears throat> loved God's word. And he was such a good example for us. I remember when I was 12 years old, he gave me a Bible. I still have it. When he handed it to me, he said, look at this, son. And he opened it up to the first page, and he wrote this for me. My wish is that you would ever serve him. What a blessing to have a dad who had that in mind all along the way as he was raising me, watching over my life as a young man. So grateful for a godly mentor. So we're going we're gonna to learn about Joshua today who followed a mentor. And we're going to see how he had great success and how that success will apply to us too if we follow God obediently. So the first thing I think we see, I don't hear people talk about it a whole lot. It's not emphasized, but I just wanted to bring it out. He patiently served and honored Moses. Exodus 33, 11 shows us something. I want to look at the secondary meaning of this passage. I want you to notice that it says in Joshua's youth here, when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man. So here's Joshua as a young man would not depart from the tent. So he's there with Moses right from the beginning. And then Numbers 11, there's some people prophesying in the camp. And Joshua's like, hey, you're not the big deal. Moses is the big deal. And Moses kind of rebukes him and says, no, no, God can use a lot of people. If they're of God, we're going to let them go. But I want you to notice, again, the secondary thought here. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' assistant since his youth. So you see youth in there. A fascinating truth about Joshua, he was a servant minister to Moses from his youth. And not only that, but he was a servant minister for 40 years before he led. Think of that. 40 years as a young man, he comes alongside the man of God, Moses. The Bible calls Moses the most humble servant of the Lord on the face of the earth. Joshua's coming alongside him, and Joshua's got some skills. I mean, he's a genius as a military strategist. He's the general. He wins when he goes into battle. And yet, his primary focus is always to serve Moses. I think there's something for us to learn here. Joshua taking the time to learn from his mentor, to be discipled. As he followed Moses, here's what he learned. He, he learned to serve others. Moses was a servant. He learned to care for and minister to people. He learned to know the value of the presence of the Lord. All of these things before taking the realm, the reins, as a leader. Joshua was blessed to have this opportunity to learn from Moses, to serve Moses. I want you to know that God will bless you as you honor and follow authority. Not just spiritual authority, but authority in life. I think there's a message here for us. 40 years? Seriously? Now, Moses lived to be 120. So that might, you know, if you calculate it for our lives, that might be 30 years or 27 years or whatever percentage-wise. But a long time when this dude had it. He had the gift. He was well-liked. He was loved. But he was following God, and God was saying, I want you to be here right now. 
You may not have heard this name, but a famous preacher of yesteryear, his name was F.B. Meyer. And a young preacher once approached him and asked how he could one day be as influential and as well-known as Dr. Meyer. And Pastor Meyer responded, don't waste your time waiting or longing for large opportunities. They may never come, but faithfully handle the little things that are always claiming your attention. Here's the thing. If you will be faithful to the Lord in the place that he's placed you, you won't miss his will for your life. You won't miss the big thing that he may have for you if you're faithful in the little things. David, on the backside of the desert. Nobody even thought about David as being king. Dad didn't believe in him and didn't bring him to the camp. His brothers didn't believe in him. You just come here to try to kill Goliath so you can get famous. His family didn't believe in him. They didn't think he was going to be a great leader. Sometimes we don't see it. But David was faithful on the backside of the desert with a few sheep. He was faithful when the bear and the lion rose up to guard those sheep, to be courageous. And David had a heart after the Lord. Did you know that when you're faithful in the little things and you're cultivating that heart of obedience and you're being faithful to God when nobody's watching, that that is precious to him and that is what he sees and will bring forward in time. Just be faithful where you're at. You're not going to miss it if you'll be faithful. How about your workplace? Let's take it there for just a moment because Moses is a spiritual leader, right? So we can speak in spiritual terms, but I think it's still spiritual at your workplace right now, your business. And you may not have a Christian leader. You may have. But I believe that the best workers are Christians. Here's why. Because they have integrity. When it's working right, I know there are Christians who don't, so-called Christians, we'll say, don't have integrity. And they, they don't speak truth. And they might gossip. I know there's people like that. But when it's working right, Christian workers are, they're full of integrity. They have character. They care about others around them. They work to be productive. The Bible tells us to do that. And they honor authority. And let me tell you something. That combination is hard to find in this world. And even secular businesses, when they find people like that, that is a diamond. That is a gem. That is beautiful to them, and they will promote it over time. I don't think that our motive should be, I'll be really good, and then maybe I'll get promoted. I think our motive should be to be faithful to the Lord. But here's another factor, whether it's a spiritual leader or your, or your leader at work. I mean, after all, we're trying to be productive. We're trying to make it work, right? Here's what the Bible says in Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So that is your ministry, going to work and doing that every day and, and doing it well. And I want to talk about a term that I don't even know if you can say this from the pulpit, uh, but I'm about to, brown noser. Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, I think it could really hurt you. I think the enemy could use that term to keep you from serving the leader that God's put in front of you. So you got this leader at work. He may not be perfect in every way. She may not be perfect. I mean, when you look at Moses, you could make an argument that Moses had an anger problem. I know he's one of the most humble, and I know he's a great man of God, but the point is nobody's perfect. But he killed an Egyptian soldier. Had to probably had some anger in his heart when he did that. He threw the tablets down. You think when God wrote with his finger on those things, he wanted to do it again? He probably wanted them to just take that, that set of them down. But Moses busted them up. And then he struck the rock in anger and couldn't enter into the promised land. So you could say, well, why would I follow a leader like that? Well, he wasn't perfect, but he's one of the greatest men of God that ever walked this earth. You're not going to find a perfect leader. If you're waiting to serve that leader until you find one that's perfect, you will never serve a leader. Now, I'll be the first to say, especially for spiritual leadership, that it should be humble. I, when I speak of leadership, I always like to put the word servant in front of it. So here's what my, my thought about leadership is that, no, you don't carry my bags. The man of God carries your bags. I carry your bags. That's, that's to me, spiritual, spiritual leadership. But when you find a leader, let's talk spiritual leadership for a moment. You find a leader that is humble and is a servant of the Lord. I just want to ask you a question. Do you, do you think maybe the Lord would want them to be served as well? I mean, maybe humbly serve them as well because they're humbly serving. You have no idea the weight that's on your boss. 
You have no idea the weight that's on spiritual leaders at times. And we need to be careful. Here's what it says in Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they're accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not sorrow. That would certainly be of no benefit to you. So if there's a servant leader and God calls you to come alongside, that's what God did with Joshua here. But at work, here's, here's a secondary thought. Not just serving them, but get wisdom. Why do you think they're there? They've been promoted because they have experience. Because they know a thing or two. You know something and you want to tell them that's something. And then you go to them about why they made a decision. And they'll tell you three things you didn't know that trumped the first. You're like, oh yeah, okay. And you might hear, I really want to get there, but I need time because of this. I've got all these other factors. They have to balance things. But they're having success. They've had success because they've done something well. Get wisdom from them in the workplace, at church, in ministry as well. Get wisdom. Proverbs 19, 18 says, those who get wisdom do themselves a favor and those who love learning will succeed. So serve the leader. You're not a brown noser. You're following the word of God. Now you can do it for the wrong motive, but if you do it for the motive, he says, to bless them, right? You want them to bless you. How about if you bless them, huh? I don't, I don't know how people never think about that for their leader. I want you to bless me, but they never think about blessing them. Bless your boss. Would you do that? Just bless them with a good attitude. Don't be that person that, that causes problems. And I'll tell you, I've had some really good mentors in my life. My dad, I spoke of him already. Dick Foth is one of my mentors. For 25 years, Dick has walked with me, helped me. I've watched him and looked at the strength of his life. Worked in a small group with him for 19 years as we met twice a year. But he calls me and he talks to me. You know what I know about Dick? That he loves me even if I don't have success in the world's or the church's terms. He's just going to love me. That he's going to be there for me. Another mentor for me was a district superintendent for the Assemblies of God, Earl Book. Just a great man of God. So humble. Such a blessing to me. Spent, spent time with me, meeting with me when I was a young pastor here. My dad and, and uh, Earl Book are gone now. But I have Dick Foth. And then I still have my mentor, Denny Davis, who lives in Washington now. He's retired. Denny was the pastor of the People's Church in Salem, Oregon. When I started out in ministry, I was in a situation that was a fairly tough situation. As a matter of fact, I had leaders that meant well, but they probably didn't make good decisions, and I was trying to work it out. And you say, well, when don't you follow a leader? I'll tell you when you don't. Number one, if you're called there to work, then just do it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength for the Lord, right? Number two, if they're asking you to sin, you don't follow sin, okay? That's where, that's where you break. If they say, you write down on there and you cheat or, you, or you're going to be fired, just be fired. The Lord's with you and keep his hand on your life, okay? So there's a, there's a place where you'd make a break. But, but when you get with people who know how to, to have integrity, how to follow God in the case as it is with Denny Davis, there's great blessing. Let me tell you about Denny. I'd come from a place that was a hard place, but I went into a place that had great leadership as a pastor. As a matter of fact, I hope this doesn't sound cocky in any way, but this church has been greatly blessed by Denny Davis because Denny Davis poured into my life. And Denny Davis taught me about integrity and truthfulness. I just remember him saying, when you go to speak somewhere and you've got that little refrigerator where you can get in and get all those goodies, don't you dare do it unless they told you you can. Not even a penny. Like, not even a penny, man, that's a big deal, I guess. Well, that got into my heart. Not even a penny. I hear that, but not even a penny. Don't mess around with God's money and God's people, right? Not even a penny. Denny built that into my heart, along with my other mentors at some level. But I got to learn from his leadership. And Denny uh, had integrity, but he was a hard worker. And he was into faithfulness. But one of his great gifts was wisdom. Wisdom. I'm talking to you about learning from you know, choosing those mentors, you might actually be discovering those mentors. Like God has them there, but you're not looking for them. So sometimes you discover it. <clears throat> Denny used to read a chapter of the Proverbs every day, and he read through Proverbs every month. That was part of his disciplines for devotion. 
Well, if you're going to be in the book of Proverbs and read every day and really soak that in, one of the things that's going to happen to you is you're going to end up being a wise person because there's great wisdom in the Proverbs. Wisest man at the time and the face of the earth. The only one who surpassed him was Jesus eventually with wisdom. And I remember not, not only being with Denny at the church, but when he went to be the district superintendent for the Sims of God, 200 churches in Oregon that he had oversight of, I followed him as the district youth director for the Assemblies of God, working with youth pastors and camps and training. And what a privilege it was to be involved with this great man of God and watch how he led. I remember going in one time to the presbyters. And that day, it was 16 presbyters who were all dressed in blue or black suits. And they were a little bit older, and I was 26 years old, coming in as a district youth director. And I was trying to fix something that I thought needed to be fixed, but I needed their permission. They weren't allowing us to wear shorts in camps. And I told them, look, I just came from being a youth pastor, and I tried to work this, but when you, when you tell an unsaved kid that you want them to come to camp, you invite them, and then you tell them you can't wear shorts, they don't get it. And they, they think it's weird. And then they ask why, and you say, well, because we might get cinder poisoning, which is the excuse they were using. I guess there's cinder gravel at the camp, and if you scraped yourself, you get cinder poisoning. I'm not even sure it exists, but that's what we were saying. <clears throat> and they're called presbyters, but they felt like press biters on that day. I mean, they're all staring down their glasses, their noses at me, and I'm like, ugh, you know. And one of them says, well, I didn't know it, but there is a spirit, an evil spirit in culottes. I didn't even know what culottes were. Raise your hand if you do not know what culottes are. Raise your hand. All right. Thank you for affirming my ignorance. I guess it's like a skirt that has a slit in it, so it's like shorts. It's like a, you know, a skort or, or something like that. And this guy said, there's an evil spirit. And he said, one year, we let the girls wear skorts, and there was underwear that was flown up the flagpole. Honest to goodness truth, this happened just as I'm saying. I said, oh, yeah, that was my underwear. I said, I was there with junior high boys. It was my birthday. They stole my underwear. They flew it up a flagpole. I'm not sure they're demonic, but they are rascals. I'll tell you that. <clears throat> so we had this thing going back and forth. I'm just trying to get kids to wear shorts so we can get more in camp that they might be saved, that they might be touched by God. And just battling through a little bit of legalism there. And Danny Davis listened for a long time. He's the district superintendent now. And then at the end, he, I'm talking about wisdom, his wisdom. He said, okay, fellas, so here's the deal. I want you to know that there's a difference between standards and convictions and righteousness. He said, standards, you might have a personal standard that's your own. Maybe it's because you once bet on pool, so you don't play pool anymore because it's a temptation for you. That's a good standard for you, but that's not necessarily for everybody else. Then he said, convictions, you may have a strong conviction, but it's not necessarily sin. Let me give you an example there. That might be, well, I don't want to drink alcohol because my dad was an alcoholic. My grandpa was an alcoholic. I'm not going to mess with it. That's good to have a conviction like that if that's the case. But the standard in the scriptures, I mean, you can argue about it, but it's moderation. That's what the standard is. Like, don't ever be drunk. And, and so he said, there's, there's standards and there's convictions, and then there's righteousness. Righteousness is where God makes it clear that you do not do this, you don't cross this line, like adultery, because it's sin. And he said, here's the question we need to ask, or, ask ourselves today. Is it a sin to wear shorts? And I looked around at these guys, and I thought, this Denny Davis guy is good, man. He's wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. We took a vote. <clears throat> And with Denny's vote, it lost nine to eight. No shorts in camps. I'm thinking bummer. And then Denny says, well, I don't know if you realize it, but we just voted out our current policy. We voted on our policy, no shorts in camps. And it has to pass by two-thirds, and it did not pass by two-thirds, so we have to get a new policy. No joke. We were in there for over three hours talking about shorts in camp. And uh, <clears throat> eventually, we won the right to get shorts in camps, I think it even increased our camps. We had to make them understand that we'd be safe, that it wasn't sinful. But thank the Lord, we got shorts and camps. And Denny's wisdom in those situations, you know what he's teaching me? Not just about shorts. He's teaching me, you don't have to be mean-spirited when you're a leader. 
If it's God, you can get wisdom from God and you can lead people and you can do it in a loving way and you don't push them. You don't force anything. You just put the, the truth out there and let it settle and then lead someplace. And if they follow, it'll be a blessing. If they don't, it just is what it is. Mentors are good to have and we need to get wisdom from them. Second thing <clears throat> we see in Joshua, he was courageous and obedient to God's word. One of the great passages of the Bible, Joshua 1, 7 through 9. I'll read the one scripture now and a couple later in, in this passage. But these are so good. And this is where Joshua is being encouraged. Moses is, is, is being left behind. Joshua is stepping out on his own. And God says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Now, let's talk about success for a moment. When an American hears success, we think business and money. We think fame. If you look at that word in the Hebrew definition, that's not what it's talking about. It could include that, but it's way bigger than that. It's on God's terms, success. And success is way bigger than money. It's the blessing of a family that's together. It's the blessing of a wholeness. It's the blessing of that integrity that would protect and it keeps you from pain. Success has to do with God's eternal terms. It has eternity in mind, ultimately. You see, you can have great success in business. You can have fame and you can die with your barns full. It talks about that in the New Testament. But the Bible says to the man who died with his barns full of stuff that he collected in this life, you fool. I mean, that's a lot to say. I wouldn't say it, but God's word said it. You fool. Today, your soul will be required of you. He could have sent that all ahead as blessing and treasure in heaven. He could have delivered so many on this earth, but he made it all about himself. So he was successful in the earth's terms, but that's not really God's terminology here. It might include that, but I'll tell you something that's a thought that I have. It might surprise you. God's not against money. He's just not. He's not against you being rich. He's not. There's a bunch of rich believers in the Bible. But God wants you to be completely his. And I, I'll give you a thought here. You can't give a rich man or woman too much money. You know why? Because if they're really God's, it'll go where he wants it to go. Now, you got to be completely in God's hands, and you got to be God's stewards. But I listen, trust me, I know several millionaires. They've helped build this through the years. You've done the core of it, but they've come alongside who they're looking for places to, to take their gift to a place where they can give into God's kingdom and sow in that his work might go forward. So they'll sow into building a Christian school. They'll, they'll sow into helping the poor and encouraging people to give, even in kingdom builders, because they feel called of God. They're men and women of God completely in God's hand, and they know it's not really their money. It's his, and they're saying, God, where does it go? Okay, I'm getting out of my notes. Better get back here. But it's true for us today, too. If we're courageous and obedient, God will promote us, just like he did Joshua. Did you know that courage in the face of trouble is admirable, and every generation for all time has admired it? Courage. Joshua had courage. We're having a little trouble with courage. Cancel culture, which I'll talk a little bit about next week when you talk about Elijah on Mount Carmel. Cancel cultures out there. We're so afraid. We don't, we don't understand courage so much anymore. We, we think in terms of safety. You know, being safe. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to get called out on social media. And, and there's, at some level, there's, there's evenness and carefulness that we need to walk in with wisdom. You can make people mad by just throwing truth out there with a bad spirit, right? But, but God likes courage. He liked it. He saw it in this soldier. He saw it in the life of Joshua, and he called it out, said, I want you to be courageous. I got a lot for you, but you're going to have to be courageous. You're going to have to march around those walls seven times. I'm going to give you victory in many, in many lands, and eventually I'm going to have you lead these people into the promised land. Someone told me the story of a man who brought the tail of a man-eating lion in. And he said, I've just cut this off of a man-eating lion. And someone said to him, well, why didn't you cut the head off? And he said, oh, 
someone had already done that. Like we act courageous, but we, we, we don't really step into places where courage and obedience is, is honored. For, for instance, we're having all kinds of pressures happening in public schools like crazy. And you better watch out for your kids. You never heard me talk like this about the public schools. But you better watch out about what they're teaching right now. Because they're, they're teaching transgenderism. They're, they're teaching that homosexuality is, is normal and one of ten of you are this. So experiment. That's happening. I'm just telling you, that's happening today. And you can be okay, but you're going to have to carefully navigate as you go through this. And you're going to have to keep your kids close to you and speak the word. And by the way, keep them in church. Get them in the youth group. Get them in the children's ministry because we'll reinforce all the goodness. But here's the deal. It takes courage to stand for the truth of God's word today. Because these things of sexuality that I just mentioned, God makes it obvious where the boundaries are there. And he's not trying to keep us from having fun. He's trying to keep us from having pain. He's the one who created us. He's the one who knows which way we should go. He wants to bless our lives. So he gives us these boundaries. It's because he loves us. Because he loves everybody. He's trying to draw us to himself. But what I want you to know is it may take courage to stand against that. You don't necessarily have to be a protester, but you better watch out and guard. What they're after ultimately is not these things of sexuality in the Bible. They're moving to the place. They're doing the same thing that the enemy did with Adam and Eve when they were tempted to eat from the apple or the fruit. The devil said to them, the serpent said, has God really said? Well, listen, if you believe the word and you trust the word, God has really said. But what they're trying to do is break it down. We don't trust the word. It's ancient. It's archaic. It's not anointed. It's, it's not a, a word that's completely truth. That's what they're trying to tell you. It's just a history book. Well, then how come it's the bestseller by 10 times every year? How come it's transformed lives throughout all history? How, how come there's so much power in this book way beyond every other book? Because the Spirit of God wrote this book through men and the Spirit of God attends this book. But what they're really after is if they can say that these things in the Bible aren't true, what they're leading us to, and you can see it happen in this culture, is that Jesus is not the only way. Has God really said, Jesus is not the only way? That's what they're really after, and it's starting to happen already. It takes courage to hold on to your values and to follow the Word of God and to be o obedient. It takes courage to stand up and give a positive report because we can look at it and say, oh, everything's so bad. The world's so against God uh, that we are not going to win. Uh, this is terrible. I can't stand it. You're watching the news so much that it's, it's, it's making you schizophrenic uh, because here's the deal. God's in charge. I mean, one of the things about my dad, about Joshua, he just knew God was in charge. God can and God will. Just stay close to God, and he'll get it done eventually. Follow what he says, and you'll be blessed. But here they were, Joshua and Caleb. Let's go to this other story now around his courage and his obedience to God. There were men in the book of Numbers, Numbers 14. Joshua had led the people right up to the land of Canaan. He sent 12 spies in. And they looked for 40 days. They spied out the land. And then there were people who came back. Ten of them said, man, it's terrible. There's giants. The cities are fortified. We'll never get in. They're impenetrable. There's no way we can take this land. There's too many of them. They're too big. They have too much power, army, forces. And Joshua's like, what? Oh, my, that's not what I saw. And here's what he says, along with Caleb in Numbers 14. Let me read it to you. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. So they've just heard this negative report, and they're like, no, no, this is wonderful. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land, and he'll give it to us. It's a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord. I mean, they knew in that moment that it was a key moment for the nation of Israel. Don't be afraid of the people of the land. They're only helpless prey to us. They have no protection. Completely the opposite of what others were thinking. Why? Because they were looking at God when others were looking at the circumstances around them. Elliot, one of the things I love so much about the way you're leading, and didn't the, 
Aren't they doing a great job in the worship band? Isn't Elliot doing a great job? Let's thank the Lord. Leading us into the presence of the Lord. Not just singing songs about him, but leading us into the presence of the Lord. I like the songs you sing, Elliot, because they speak of Jesus. They speak of God and God's characteristics. And I'm not against these all these worship songs, but I'm telling you, I get tired of too many songs that are like, I'm feeling really bad, and life sucks, and but God is there, and he really loves me anyway, and I'll probably make it. That's what it feels like to me with some of these songs. It's just like, man, stop singing about that and start singing about Jesus. Because here's the deal. When you start looking at him and his power and his characteristics and his love, the perspective of everything around you changes. Now you got his perspective. He's with me. He loves me. Now I'm going to do something. We're going to do a little reaction. I'm going to say he is with you and you're going to say he loves me, okay? Turn to someone and say, just, I know it's dumb, but just do this. Turn to someone and say that right now. I'm going to say he is with you, and you're going to say he loves me. He is with you. Okay. I want to say that was weak, but let's just say we can do better, okay? He is with you. Okay. Just about twice that loud. We're getting there. He is with you. Yes, he does. He loves you, and he's all powerful, and he's going before you. He's encircling around you. You say, I'm losing, I'm losing. Hey, losing today doesn't mean that victory is lost. Taking a step back doesn't mean that you're not going to spring forward to win someday. That happened all along the way with Israel. But when we follow God, now let me tell you something. I think this is true. Karen tells me it may not be true. But I think I can be okay if I don't have the ministry as a pastor. I think as long as Karen loves me, that I could go to Costco and work there and be really happy without having any leadership or authority whatsoever. As a matter of fact, honest to goodness truth, never wanted to be a pastor. I don't, I don't treasure it. I'm following the will of God for my life. I want to follow the will of God and do what he's asked me to do. I want to be courageous and obedient in that. But I don't need this. I just, if she loves me, I'm going to be okay. You say, well, I don't have a Karen. Well, let me tell you, the higher place that we need to go with that. Because you can understand, yeah, if your spouse really loves you, man, it doesn't matter all this stuff. But here's the deal. God really loves you. You don't need a Karen or a Stan. You've got God. God will lead you to a Karen or a Stan, but you've got God. He is on your side. He has all power. He knows your situation. He knows that you don't have work. He knows that, that you might lose that account. He knows what your father has said to you and how that brought pain. He knows all this stuff. And what he says is, I really love you. I'm really for you. Just take my hand and I will lead you through. You can be okay as long as you keep your hand in his. And I'll say this, that he'll lead you well beyond where you thought you'd go if you just humbly take his hand and follow him. Just say, Lord, what are you saying? What do you want for now? And I believe he'll reveal his will to you as you seek him. The Bible says, draw close to him and he'll draw close to you. I know it's true that he is in the hearts of every believer. But I also know it's true that he said, come close to me and I'll come close to you, that when we get close, he shows himself. When we seek him with all of our hearts, we find him. And when you get serious with him, he will lead you. That's what I believe because he's done that for me along the way. Joshua affirmed the positive report and in doing so, he was reminding the people of the eternal covenant that God had made with them. You follow me, and I will give you victor. victory. Be the victor. You follow me, and I will give you victory. He's reminding them of that. It's here for all of us in Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is for me. Someone here, this is for you right now. Just those words, the Lord is for you. You think he's just for everybody else. He hasn't shown up for you. But that's a lie from the enemy. I just want to kick the devil in the teeth and make him bleed when he says that to people and makes them believe it. God is for you. He loves you. And when you understand that, you can move to this next place. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Years ago, I went to speak at a church. They asked me to come during their spiritual emphasis week. It was Steve Jameson 
and the great church called East Ridge in Issaquah, Washington. They had a piece of land that they were on. They, they were growing, and they bought 12 acres, and I was supposed to come in their spiritual emphasis week as they were just about to move forward with all their plans, and that week, the city of Seattle denied permission for them to build on their land at some level, and it was very discouraging. The level was, you can build, but we want the maximum for any new church that arises in the Seattle area to be 400 chairs. You can't build more than 400 chairs. Well, they had more than that where they were already. They needed space because the Lord was blessing. Lives were being changed. And I came in, and that night as I preached, the Lord had had us down the road a little bit where we were just ahead of them, and we had seen some miracles when we were told it couldn't happen, even with the permits. Did you know there was a time where they told us they weren't going to give us uh, water and rights for permission for the land here so we couldn't build? And that was discouraging. And every time something happened like that, we'd go to prayer. And then at that office, Pastor John walked in years ago to that office that controlled these water rights. And as he walked up, Darlene, who goes to our church and was over 80 years old, had been working there for scores of years. And she saw Pastor John up there. And she walked up to Pastor John. Well, Darlene, they love Darlene in that office. Darlene's loved on them for years. She's not the boss, but she's the encouragement of the office. She walks up, hugs Pastor John. She says, guys, this is my friend. This is my pastor. We need to help Pastor John, whatever he needs. God is my witness. They huddled a little bit. And before John walked out of there, he had water rights permission because Darlene had been working in that office for all the years. Let's give the Lord glory for that, right? So we had, we've had victories like that. And I'm standing before these people and I can feel their discouragement as I'm preaching. And the spirit of the Lord came upon me and I gave a prophetic word. You say, how do you know it's prophetic? Well, first of all, you have to be humble enough, simple enough, <laughs> that might surprise you, to hear it. Humble enough to speak it knowing you could be wrong. Those are two things about prophecy. You say, well, I might make a mistake. How are you going to learn? You feel the prompting of the Lord you share. If you mess up, just be humble and say, oh, I must have messed up on that. Tell the people too. But the third thing that would show it, if it's really God, you humble and you speak it, is if it actually happens later, then you can see that it was God. And I found myself saying to that church in Issaquah, listen to me. The city of Seattle is not in charge. God Almighty is in charge. Jesus has been given all authority. And if God wants you to have a church, you're going to have a church. They are not going to be able to stop you because God is greater. And I just said it. You will build on that land. And a big ovation came out because they were discouraged. Well, thank the Lord. Years later, they're there. They built a 1,200-seat sanctuary. Lives are being healed. People are being changed. Miracles are happening. They're giving to kingdom builders millions of dollars. It's a life-changing place. You feel like this world is in charge. You feel like you're under all those circumstances. Listen, it is moving to a place where darkness will come, but Jesus will overcome eventually. And there's been a prophecy that will be taken and snatched out of this world. And I would just say to you, have confidence in him. Have confidence that even if you're going down, you're going up. Have confidence that even if you've, you've been pushed back, that you're going to go forward. Because God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? And that's what Joshua was trying to tell the people. Joshua 1.8. Study this book of instruction Continuing, this follows verse 7 where God said, be strong and courageous. Talking about success in your life. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my commandment, my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Third thought, and I'll move quickly here. God promoted Joshua because of his Patience, faithfulness, and courage. He will promote you too because of your faithfulness, your patience, and your courage. He knows where he's taking you. He knows his timing. Listen to me. It often takes longer than you think it would. And it's often harder than you thought it would be. 
But if you miss his timing, you miss his will. There are lessons all along the way that are deep treasures that he wants to build in you. He's not just wanting to give you success. He's building you up. He's making you stronger. He's going to make you a blessing to others, not just bless you in that moment. Joshua 4.14, that day the Lord made Joshua a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. For the rest of his life, they revered him as much as they revered Moses. Stay with God and he'll stay with you. You fall away and take a path that's not the path he's saying and it's just going to take longer. Just stay with him when he gives you direction. May not make sense in the moments. Quite often he doesn't want it to make sense to you because he wants faith to be exercised. But he'll make it obvious. Stay with him. Joshua is one of the greatest leaders. Joshua became rather one of the greatest leaders of Israel through faithful obedience to God. And as a successor to Moses, Joshua led the people of Israel into the promised land. Moses, the one who'd given the law, it wasn't the law that took him in. It was Joshua. Did you know that Joshua is Yeshua in the Hebrew, and that's the name Jesus? And Yeshua is the, is the one who brings salvation. Joshua was the one. He's the type in the shadow of Christ who would lead the people into the ultimate victory into Canaan. And, he, and, and God shows up in the New Testament. But listen, when, when, with Jesus, to show that he's the way to salvation, but the Old Testament is all part of the story that's God's building. And Joshua is a type and shadow of Jesus in the story. God will promote you as you trust in him. He'll take you to the promised land as you keep your hand in his and, and you're obedient. Story is told of the great General Napoleon from France. He once lost control of his horse in the middle of a group of his army. And as his horse reared up, a private in the army stepped in, and at his own endangerment, he reached up and grabbed the reins and calmed the horse down. And Napoleon looked at the private and said, thank you for your help, captain. In that moment, because of his obedience and courage, he was promoted. And I, I just want you to know, I don't know what God has for you, but there's an apex in your life. That apex may just be that Costco worker who leads 14 people to Jesus and sets people free in their lives. That's as beautiful as anything, any life you could live. But the point is, that wholeness, that faithfulness that blesses our families as we trust God and we follow God, that love of God that permeates our hearts as we understand it for ourselves and we give it to others, as we follow him in obedience, we'll find success in God's terms, wholeness all around us, blessings that move not only through this life but to eternity stick with him I just want to close with this thought of Jesus we're going to talk about Old Testament and New Testament characters in this Be the Victor series next week Elijah I'm going to try to get to Jesus every week because it all leads to Jesus you talk about courage what kind of assignment is it to say, you're going to go down there, you're going to get persecuted, you're going to do miracles, you're going to do nothing but good, you're going to be the most hated person in that area, also the most loved, ironically, but the most hated, and you're going to give your life, you're going to die, but I'll raise you up. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like an awesome assignment on the surface, right? But the Bible says in Hebrews, who for the joy set before him, he endured this pain, dis despising the cross, and now he sits down at the right hand of the Father. He's risen again. It was all in the plan of God. He died on that cross because the punishment of sin was falling on him. He never sinned ever in his life. Sinless, the spotless lamb, the Bible says. But our sin fell upon him that day. It was the plan of God for the sake of you and I who are here today. We can be forgiven. You say, man, I've messed up so much, God wouldn't want me. It's not true. That's a lie from the enemy. What would shock you right now is to just get a little deeper in conversation with the people around you and see where they once were. <laughs> it would shock you. But we're the redeemed. We're forgiven. And you can be redeemed and forgiven. He loves you. And he'll give you heaven as your home and the best life here on this earth. It's called the abundant life. But listen to the courageous warrior, Jesus Christ. He humbled himself, Philippians 2.8. 
in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Talk about courage. Thank you, Jesus, for your courage. God wants to bless your life. Will you turn it completely over to him? I want you to bow your heads and we're going to pray. Father, I ask for a work of salvation right now. If you're here in this place today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you haven't been following him. Maybe you once followed him, but for years you haven't and you know you haven't. Here's what he says to you. I love you. I'm pursuing you with my love. You don't have anything to fear because I just want to bless you. I want to bless your life. Turn to me and let me love you. Let me bless you. That's what the Lord would say to you. Perhaps you've never known Jesus, but something is compelling you to know today that he's real. The Spirit of God is here to lead you to Jesus Christ so that you might be saved and have eternal life and you might be blessed in this life. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you want to invite Christ into your heart, we're going to pray in just a moment. When we pray, I'll lead you in a prayer line by line. And you'll speak each word, a prayer that says Jesus is Lord, a prayer to ask for forgiveness of sin, a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. But you won't be speaking by yourself because everyone in this room will pray that prayer with you to lend strength to your voice. We're not here to single you out or embarrass you. But God is here. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, please. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand if you want to invite Christ into your heart. I'll just be the witness before God. Please, no one else looking around. Are you ready? He loves you so much. Just lift your hand on the count of three if you're ready to receive him. And you're saying, I'm going to pray that prayer along with everyone here today. One, two, three. Just lift your hand up quickly if that's you. Okay, God bless you and you and you. Keep your hand up, okay? God bless you and you. You can put your hands down. Oh, Lord, there are people who are turning to you today. You love them so much. You've been pursuing them with your love. Now we're all going to pray. If you lifted your hand, if you're ready, maybe you didn't lift your hand. Maybe I didn't see your hand. God knows your heart. But if you want Jesus, you pray it with all of us. Everybody say this. Say, Father God, please forgive me. I've sinned and I've made a lot of mistakes. But I believe that you love me. I believe that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and make me brand new. I'm going to follow you with my life. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to worship here in just a moment. But here's what the Bible says. When even one person comes to Jesus, that the angels in heaven rejoice. There's no greater miracle than someone coming to Jesus. You could grow a leg, and it's not as, if there wasn't a leg there, you could grow a leg. Or a third leg. It'd be miraculous, but it's it's not as big as this that just happened. Lives are changed for eternity. This is real. And if the angels in heaven rejoice, why don't we just rejoice with them? Let's give Jesus a standing ovation. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace and your salvation. Now bow your heads. Two more things quickly. The Lord may speak. I've spoken to you. I didn't even speak it, but the Lord may have spoken to you about some area where he wants you to be obedient and faithful. Just something, maybe it's hanging in there and don't get off the trail. Maybe it's something that's that's presenting temptation to you. He doesn't want you to stay on that path because it's going to lead to something bad. Maybe you're on the wrong path of a habit or a hang up, but God is speaking about obedience to you. Would you just under your breath right now. Just pray and offer that to the Lord, whatever it is he's speaking. And if nothing comes to mind, just say, Lord, I want to be faithful and obedient. God, help us. Help us to be faithful and obedient to you because you only have our welfare in your mind and in your heart. You only want to bless us and lead us down a path that will bring the goodness that you've planned for us. So Lord, we yield our lives. Now with every head bowed and every eye closed, If you can say this, God, help me to gain godly wisdom from mentors. You might have in this, I need to discover who my mentors are. But there might be men and women of God. There might be someone God wants you to learn from, even at work. But if you can say, God, 
Help me to gain godly wisdom from mentors. I want you to lift your hand. You just, you just saying, God, okay, God, I received that from your word. I see it in there. So Lord, there's a number of us. We want godly mentors. We'd like to be that too. We yield our lives, Lord, as servants. But God, bless this church as we follow you. And may we be people, may we have people that can say, follow me as I follow Christ, as Paul did. And God, I pray that the humility and the understanding of who you are would be a mark of this church so that we might lift you up above all else and follow Jesus as our Savior. May it be in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Let's worship for a few moments before we go this morning.